Hello, and welcome to a discussion on the gospel topics essays. If you don't know what those are, you're about to. Uh, my name is Alan Mount. I'm going to be leading this conversation, or at least moderating it. Um, the gospel topics essays have have been a, a central point of of both introspection and uh, a lot of study over the past few years for me. But but before we get into all of that, I'd love to introduce uh, my co-host today. I'm joined today by by two gentlemen that that have also been digging into these uh, essays, and I'd love to hear their perspective. Uh, first up, we have Bill Real. Yeah, grateful, Alan, for the chance to be part of this conversation. These essays uh, are something that really played an important part in my own journey, and uh, for good and for bad, and and love the chance just to kind of talk about, especially today, this first vision, uh, these first vision accounts uh, in this essay, and the impact that that's had on my life. Thanks, Bill. And Anthony Miller. Thanks for the intro, Alan. Um, yeah, I stumbled across the essays a little bit more than 37 months ago. And actually, the one that we're going to talk about today is the very first essay that I read. And uh, my, I'm really curious to talk about how we experience these essays differently and how maybe they affected me differently than they affected my wife and my and some of my friends so i'm looking forward to the discussion appreciate that now everybody listening has to recognize right now i have to say it is 7 38 in the morning which isn't terribly early but as the time goes on in this first episode uh, i imagine that the the energy level will will spike uh, this is a really fun topic and i appreciate what you said anthony of Everyone experiences it a little bit differently. Uh, when I was started reading the, the, the essays in 2014, uh, this essay didn't jump out at me. This wasn't the one of the ones that caused a whole lot of dissonance. So even just between the three of us, I think that there's there's differing experiences. Uh, it's very important. I, I, Bill, I, it was your idea to start with with the first vision. Can you talk a little bit before we actually jump into the essay, why you thought this was a good place to start? So I'm a convert. Uh, I was a convert to the church. I, I joined the LDS church when I was 17 years old, and the missionaries came into my home, and they told me this story about this young man who was 14 years old in a grove of trees, and that two heavenly beings appeared to him, Heavenly Father and his son, Jesus Christ. And I remember like listening to the missionaries and being so excited because I was 17, so I was just a few years older than this young, this young Joseph Smith. And I, and I said, like, you know, I'm a kid. And the world, the world tells me I don't know anything. The world tells me that I don't have life figured out yet. And, and, but then there's these missionaries saying, but you can go to God and you can get answers straight from him. And, and so I took that message so serious, Alan. Uh, and, and as time went on, uh, and I join the church, and I'm sitting in classes, it becomes clear that this story, this story is the foundation of Mormonism. It, it sets up uh, the church's theology of there being prophets, seers, and revelators. It sets up the uh, notion that the Holy Ghost can give you truth and answers that you can't get anywhere else. And it also uh, is the, the foundational rock that this is the one true and living church upon the earth because Joseph Smith uh, is a prophet. In these last days when we thought prophets were done, they were gone. They're not here. And so this seems like just a beautiful place to start to begin to kind of wrestle, I guess, with uh, the idea that, that things sometimes in life are a little more complicated and as I always like to say, messy than what we think they are. Thanks, Bill. I think the your your experience as a convert and hearing one of the very first things you heard, if not the first thing you heard from the missionaries, was this first vision. That's that's important to see from from my perspective of someone that was uh, the missionary telling people this message and reciting it. I could still quote it in Spanish. And actually, Anthony and I are our uh, newly found friends within the last couple of years. And one thing we learned is that we both served our missions in Barcelona, Spain. <laughs> Anthony, um, 
what is the first vision in, in, in your missionary experience, for example, and even beyond that, just in your experience as, uh, as a member of the church, what does the first vision um, really mean to you? I, I, th- I think my experiences here are somewhat similar. You know, I, we both served in Barcelona, Spain, just uh, several years apart. And um, a couple of three years apart. Yeah, I, so I remember when I was there, um, we used film strips, uh, you know, because it was before the day of uh, DVDs and uh, streaming video and so forth. And and uh, I think that it's quite likely that the film strip that I showed more frequently uh, to members and non-members alike uh, was was the one on the first vision. And And so not only... Did I have it fairly memorized in Castilian Spanish? But I could also uh, make it sound like the, I think it's an Argentinian Spanish that uh, was the voiceover in, in the uh, film strip for the first vision. It, it connected uh, substantially with me uh, for similar things to what Bill indicated is that it, it modeled that um, we could actually touch the, the face of the divine. In, in other words, that we could bring our concerns, we could bring our questions, and, and God uh, would answer us and, and know our name. Not that God would appear to us uh, physically in a resurrected form or whatnot, but that God cared about us, that, that he would answer our questions if, if we prayed to him. So it was significant to my testimony and my experience. Uh, it was one of the key uh, parts of my mission experience, and I always appreciated the opportunities as a gospel doctrine teacher or when I would bear my testimony in church to refer to the First Vision account uh, as I understood it. Definitely. You know, we'll we'll jump in here. Uh, it, my <laughs> Jumping off of the train in my first, my first area in the mission, literally the third person that we contacted, I wrote this down in my journal, the third person that we contacted my trainer pointed to me and said, say the first vision, Re- you know, repeat the first vision. I had no idea what was going on in the conversation because I didn't speak Spanish, but I recited that first vision that I had memorized. And that third contact that we had made ended up getting baptized, which in Spain, uh, that was not uh, a frequent occurrence in, in uh, having success through baptism. So that was a, a really cool experience. And the first vision played a very personal role for me on my mission, uh, personally. Bill, you mentioned one thing, and I, I want to read a quote from Gordon B. Hinckley that emphasizes this. So much emphasis is placed on the first vision. And when I was on my mission, actually, in General Conference, Gordon B. Hinckley in October of 2002 uh, said the following. He said, Our whole strength rests on the validity of that first vision. It either occurred or it did not occur. If it did not, then this work is a fraud. If it did, then it is the most important and wonderful work under the heavens. I knew a so-called intellectual who said the church was trapped by its own history. My response was that without that history, we have nothing. The truth of that unique, singular, and remarkable event, uh, the first vision, is the pivotal substance of our faith. I think it's a really good way of of introducing this topic and jumping in. I, I remember as a black and white thinking, uh, true believer with very little nuance, like almost screaming amen, you know, at, at when President Hinckley said that because it resonated so much with me. And and fast forward 12 years, right, Anthony? And now we're looking at uh, an essay and we're about to go through an essay that, that really embraces the gray or at least uh, introduces the gray to us and we're going to talk about that and what i mean by the gray is uh it's it's not quite as clear cut as it happened or it didn't there's a lot of details that may vary there's a lot of different accounts uh, and and we're going to jump into that now if you would like to follow along with us we'd we'd welcome you to if you're driving keep the phone away just listen but if you're if you're sitting down you can you can follow along with us in order to get there to the to the actual gospel topic essays if you're on a desktop uh, computer you can go to lds.org click on the top left where it says scriptures and study and then click gospel topics you'll have to scroll down to the bottom of the page uh, there is a featured topic section and at the moment it says are mormons christian love and religious freedom but beneath that there is a gospel topic essays paragraph. And at the bottom, there's a link that says essays on a number of topics. 
Now, in there you can find about the sixth one down is First Vision Accounts, and that's what we're, where we will be reading today. It's also in your uh, Gospel Topics, or excuse me, in your um, Gospel Library app. And scrolling down to Church History, you can click on there, click on Gospel Topics Essays, which is about two-thirds of the way down, and then First Vision Essay. Whew, all right, I got us there. We good? Everyone good? <laughs> all right, perfect. Now, we would like to read um, the entire essay and we've all made a few notes and we'll just kind of throw it around. But as we get going, you know, Bill, you mentioned before we started speaking uh, and recording today, uh, and this is really important. And, and when I record podcasts, I try to be as transparent as possible. We want this, this reading and even our interpretations of it to be very welcoming. And Bill, can you explain a little bit what you said? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Sure. So all three of us are coming from the perspective of having uh, dived deep into Mormon history. And in ways that we never expected, we were challenged by that. And those challenges uh, brought growth. It brought uh, angst and in, in, uh complications in terms of emotionally trying to reconcile new things that we learned with stories that we had been told. Uh, just for example, as I was saying earlier, when I, when I learned this story for the first time, I, like I can literally, in my mind, I should say that way, I can uh, very much go back in my mind to that exact moment, and it was the moment I fell in love with Mormonism when I heard the Joseph Smith story, to the point where I didn't serve a mission. But what I did do was I went out with the missionaries all the time. So as a convert at 17 years old who didn't serve a mission, I can right now recount the story out of the Joseph Smith history word for word, where, Joseph's, where Joseph writes, uh, during this time of great excitement, my mind was called up to serious reflection and great uneasiness. See, I can do that whole thing. And, and the reason is because I loved this story. And so as we jump into this account today, uh, we're coming from a perspective of, hey, we were deeply challenged by not only these gospel topic essays, but but the history within Mormonism. And, and we want to share why this these essays and why the adapting history of Mormonism, the changing history of Mormonism is really hard for some people uh, to, to simply just reconcile and move on. And, and I hope that people will sense us coming from a place of kindness and compassion and friendliness, but we also hope that you will sit with us long enough uh, to at least understand that perspective, because I think we're all better for it. Thanks, Bill. Anthony, how about this? Why don't you, could you walk us through that first paragraph? Can you read that first paragraph? Then we'll stop and see uh, what what we all have to say about that. Sure. Uh, So it reads, Joseph Smith recorded that God the Father and Jesus Christ appeared to him in a grove of trees near his parents' home in western New York State when he was about 14 years old. Concerned by his sins and unsure which spiritual path to follow, Joseph sought guidance by attending meetings, reading scripture, and praying. In answer, he received a heavenly manifestation— Joseph shared and documented the first vision as it became as it came to be known on multiple occasions. He wrote or assigned scribes to write four different accounts of the first vision. So Anthony, why, why don't we start with you with how this first paragraph is is written, the details that it gives. Kind of what who do you think that this this is is aiming for? What who is the the, the intended audience if you will? Well, my, sen- my sense uh, in-, in understanding the purpose of the essays is the intended audience are uh, believing members of the church or members of the church who have stumbled across historical information that's caused them dissonance. Um, I don't believe that the essays were written to be uh, apologetic, you know, uh, explanations to scholars or to critics of the church. I I really think that it was, uh, that they were developed specifically for believing members or members that are still struggling to hold on to belief after finding things they haven't been able to reconcile themselves with regard to church history. Right. Bill, anything jump out at you in this, in this, uh, first paragraph? 
maybe just another way of saying what Anthony did, which is that uh, the church set itself up by telling a very rigid story. It was definitive about what happened, and it also avoided telling some things at times. And so now the church, in this age of information, having the internet, it's it's wanting to be more open, or maybe in some ways, unfortunately, being compelled to be more open. And in that process, uh, it's having to tell its membership details and narratives that members have never heard before, or at least not heard parts of. And so these essays are designed to soften that transition from going from this is the way it happened to now saying like, oh, yeah, it it didn't exactly happen that way. And there's also some things we didn't tell you about. And so we want to softly move you from that old story to this new one. And I think the essays are that bridge. Yeah, yeah. yeah, One thing jumped out at me just... I'm thinking back to the first time I, I read it and even little simple things, very, very subtle words that are dropped that, that, that stand out to me. And this, and that just in that first sentence, uh, when it mentions Joseph's age, for example, it says when he was about 14 years old, when I remember reading that and thinking about 14 years old, now, hold on a second. He was 14 years old, right? It, oh, how lovely was the morning. It was the spring of 1820. Joseph being born in in 1806 in December he was he was 14 right so it, that even right from the beginning there's there's ways that this essay presents the information that's that's a little bit not concerning at this point but it's just oh okay maybe things aren't as exact as as I once thought they were if that makes sense yeah that the just following that what the first thing that jumped out to me was concerned by his sins like I, I don't remember referring to that in Spanish, uh, Castilian or Argentinian Spanish uh, on my mission. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, let's, I'll, I'll read the next paragraph. Joseph Smith published two accounts of the first vision during his lifetime. The first of these, known as Joseph Smith History, was canonized in the Pearl of Great Price, and he thus became the best-known account. The two unpublished accounts, recorded in Joseph Smith's earliest autobiography and a later journal, were generally forgotten until historians working for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints rediscovered and published them in the 1960s. Since that time, these documents have been discussed repeatedly in church magazines, in works printed by church-owned and church-affiliated presses, and by Latter-day Saint scholars in other venues. In addition to the first-hand accounts, there are also five descriptions of Joseph Smith's vision recorded by his contemporaries. There's a lot to unpack there. There's a few things that 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 came up that um that I think we probably should address. Um, Bill, you made a note here on thus became the best known account. Uh, can you tell us what you're thinking there? So, for the first, you know, again, let me say it this way: from the very beginning of my time in Mormonism, I took the time because it was uh, interesting to me to read about Mormon history. I was always looking for other sources, always looking for other details about the story that weren't in the correlated curriculum. By correlated curriculum, I mean the stuff that we hear on Sunday and the things that we get in our church periodicals, the Enzyme or the New Era or the Friend. And as I uh, went to church every Sunday and learned the church's story about its history, the first vision was absolutely, in my mind, limited to what we'll get into later, which is the 1838 account. It's the official account. It's the account that the church uses uh, and utilizes to tell this story of Joseph Smith. The other accounts are not part of the correlated curriculum, at least not until the last few years. And so when they say that it became, that the 1838 account uh, became the the best known account. The reason it's the best known account is because m- us as members didn't have any kind of ready, easy access to the 1832 or 1835 account. Prior to these gospel topic essays, prior to some of the things that have come out in the last five or six, seven years, eight years with the history every one of us as members would have had this 1838 account reinforced to us. So it didn't just become the, the best known account because it was in the Pearl of Great Price. 
It was also because we didn't have access, at least not easy access, to the other accounts. And so it, there was no other choice but to have this be the best known account. Yeah, it, it says uh, Joseph Smith's earliest autobiography and a later journal were generally forgotten until histories working for the church rediscovered and published them in the 1960s. There's a lot of, there's a lot of history in, in that one sentence that goes to what you're saying, Bill, um, goes to well, why is this canonized version, the, the version that we are familiar with and that we know. Um, does anyone want to volunteer to walk us through at a higher level, just the history of that sentence of rediscovering and publishing these, these secondary accounts, if we can call them that, in the 60s? Yeah, so, so um, that sounded a little bit different to me because we have, you know, we've always had Our Heritage, at least I always, you know, there was the book Our Heritage uh, and, and, and the other, uh, you know, books that were supplemental to when I taught gospel doctrine. And, and I was thinking, you know, why wouldn't the text of these different versions be included uh, in, in those supplemental things? Like, why... Would, would they not be included? And so when I got to footnote number one, it, it in, indicates that these documents have been repeatedly discussed in church magazines and in works printed by church-owned and church-affiliated presses. And since I don't re, hadn't remembered that in my missionary materials or, uh, you know, in institute classes or the year that I went to BYU— I followed footnote number one, and, and as you go to footnote number one, it refers to an article from the Improvement Era from 1970 by James Allen. And so I searched on the church's website for that article, and I, I couldn't find it there. And, and then there's the Richard L. Anderson Enzyme uh, article from 1996, April 1996, uh, you know, that I... I, I I'm sure that I would have stumbled across it in 1996 because I always read the enzyme, but it really didn't stand out to me. Uh, and, and in preparation for today, I went back and, and read that uh, enzyme article, and uh, it, the tone seems to be similar to the, to the essay here in that it, it kind of describes a few things about these different accounts, but it doesn't really link you to the actual text of the different accounts uh, in order to be able to kind of read them and understand them. It's more just a, a reference or an explanation. But I would have thought that since the essays indicated that, that these have been, uh, you know, repeatedly uh, included in church magazines and materials, that there would have been more than a 1970 New Era article and a 1996 uh, Enzyme article there, there would have been actually the text of the different accounts included in, in our materials. And so that made me a little bit uncomfortable. And so from there is when I went to search online and found, you know, a, a greater explanation on Wikipedia. And then I found the article in Dialogue and more information about how, what they're representing here is that the, the 1832 account, uh, they're saying that it was forgotten um, and then rediscovered and published in 1960. And I, I found out that that story is just a little bit more complicated uh, than what they seem to be expressing here. Anyway, that was my experience as I was reading this paragraph. Bill, anything to, to add to what Anthony said? And Anthony, thank you. Yeah, I, I think, unfortunately, really early here, we have to kind of complicate it with the actual story which is that Joseph Fielding Smith was called as church historian in 1921. Joseph Fielding Smith is the son of Joseph F. Smith, who is the uh, son of Hiram Smith. And, and Joseph F. Smith, I mean, saw his dad with a, a bullet hole in his face. And the traumatic experiences of seeing your uncle and your, and your father martyred uh, and having to kind of live with the visuals of that and the history of that. So his, so Joseph F. Smith's son, Joseph Fielding Smith, becomes church historian, and he understands these stories too. This is his life. This is his history. And uh, sometime after becoming church historian, he encounters Joseph Smith's letter book, this 1832 account. 
And whether it's him or somebody under his direction, he's in charge of the church history department. Somebody in the church history department cuts that 1832 account out with a pen knife and stores it away uh, in a protected, secured area in the church history department. Rumor gets out because Joseph Fielding Smith tells others that there is a peculiar first vision account, but they are not to say anything about it. And that person then tells somebody else. Eventually, some critics of the church, Gerald and Sandra Tanner, catch word, and they start to ask about it and start to speak out publicly that there is another first vision account being stored away in the church. So by this time, we are in the mid-1960s. And at that point, the 1832 account is taken out of the secured area, taped back into Joseph Smith's letter book, and uh, is given, uh, the access of it is given to a, uh, a student finishing his master's thesis named Paul Chessman. And Paul then writes his thesis on the first vision and utilizes pieces and parts of the 1832 account so as to get it out there before the critics begin to talk about it. And so when it says generally forgotten, that's true to the average membership. All of us, it was, uh, in, it was forgotten in our, it was culturally forgotten. It was forgotten in our milieu. But the reality was that there were at least some people, at least one person who knew that it was in the church history department, knew it was peculiar, knew that it would be much different than the 1838 account and wanted to essentially keep it out of uh, public awareness. And so this story becomes really challenging when we uh, essentially just kind of whitewash the issue and say like, ah, it was just generally forgotten. And then at some point we find it and then we use it. There's a lot more, as Anthony says, backstory going on there. Thanks, Bill. I think, you know, one note I'd love to make here is you just got into a lot of very detailed history that many people may not know. I didn't know it before three years ago, even two years ago, I did not know that story. And a lot of times that can make people feel uncomfortable learning something that that doesn't paint the, the more perfect picture that they expect. And so, I mean, can you, Bill, especially, I've, I have to admit, your messages over the past few years really had helped me. Can, can you help somebody understand um, when you're learning these things, you may, you may feel certain ways, this dissonance that's happening. And maybe we should have done this a little earlier, but I think it's important to address really quickly. Um, if you do feel these things, recognize what those feelings are and what they aren't. Can you talk about that just briefly? Yeah. Uh, if we, if we look at the way psychologists and social scientists look at human behavior, we are generally, most of us as human beings are in what's called ethnocentricity, which means we love our tribe. We love our tribal identity. And as Mormons, that means we love Mormonism and we love being a Mormon. When ideas or data points come out that conflict with the comfortable narratives and the comfortable beliefs that we hold as members of the church, we, we get uncomfortable. Our brain doesn't like being pushed and pulled in multiple directions. And that's what's called, as you pointed out, cognitive dissonance, which is the idea that you want to hold one position, which is this, this uh, really clean story of Mormonism. And then when you're confronted with data points that kind of push up against that, now you also want to value the fact that those are coming from legitimate sources. They, they are factual. There is some messiness to Mormon history, and it appears to be valid. And so as you're pulled in both directions, your brain doesn't like that. And so you get really uncomfortable. Unfortunately, unfortunately we've muddied the waters a little bit within religion, and specifically within Mormonism, by labeling that discomfort as something that we should dismiss or walk away from or turn our backs on. And the reality is that if we just look at human beings across the globe, the way we learn is to be challenged a little bit and to open ourselves up to hearing facts and data and seeing if that changes our comfortable beliefs. Uh, and so that does get, that is difficult for us. It's still difficult for me to this day. 
uh, but I but I, I certainly want us to value that if sources are legitimate and facts are real and they disrupt our comfortable narratives, I would suggest that maybe we just sit in that a little bit and uh, and wrestle with what that means. Oh, that's one of the most important lessons that I've learned recently is sitting in that discomfort because that's really where the where I've found a lot of growth. Okay, thank you for taking that little brief detour. I think that was important. Um, uh, I'll, I'll continue reading this this next paragraph. And let's it's, are there any other any other comments that anyone would like to make about the pre- the previous paragraph? I think uh, you both covered it very well. So so I, I I think it's relevant. I know this is a little bit of a sidetrack too, but I think it's relevant to the experience of of discomfort when we. Uh, encounter information that's maybe uh, doesn't in exactly coincide with the narratives uh, that resonate the most with us. And, and that has to do with uh, something that's referred to as confirmation bias. And so the way confirmation bias works, the way our brains work, a good example has to do with uh, automobile vehicles. So for example, the most uh, commonly registered vehicle on the road today is the Honda Accord. Um, however, the way our brains work is if you've never owned or driven or even ridden in a Honda Accord, uh, what happens in, in your brain or in our brains is we tend to not notice them on the road as we drive past them or park next to them and so forth. But due to confirmation bias and the way our brains work is that if we subsequently test drive and then purchase, own, and drive a Honda Accord and we start driving it every day, all of a sudden, we notice all the other Honda Accords that were on the road all along that were almost effectively uh, unrecognizable or invisible to us before we drove one. And, and my sense is um, that the way confirmation bias works in combination with what Bill was referring to with regard to experiencing dissonance is that what we do as human beings is that when we uh, encounter things that are that cause dissonance and that are contrary to the confirmation bias that we carry there there's this um, kind of an allegory or a symbol or an example of uh, uh, of using this idea of putting things on a metaphorical shelf so if we run into things that uh, cause us some discomfort that go against our confirmation bias um, in faith what we might do is metaphorically place those books or issues uh, on a shelf, on a wall kind of thing, with faith that we'd receive further light and knowledge with regard to those things someday. And sometimes, uh, depending on how our brains work, we can accumulate quite a few things on our metaphorical shelves. And and again, we put them there because they maybe cause dissonance or because they go contrary to our own confirmation bias. And I think as we go through this, at least one of my experiences with this essay is, is that I encountered a lot of things that caused some dissonance with regard to um, the characteristics of the Godhead uh, as I read them in the Book of Mormon and the early sections of the DNC uh, and in the Joseph Smith translation of Luke and so forth. And, and over the years, I'd encounter some things that didn't really quite seem clear to me. And so I accumulated a lot of things on my metaphorical shelf with regard to what we might run into uh, with these different versions of the essays uh, because they cause dissonance. And, and that really changed my experience reading this essay compared to what some other people might because I had so many things shelved with regard to um, what might be considered inconsistent or conflicting between the the different things here. Essentially, the idea that the things that make us comfortable, the beliefs we have that we like, we hold on to those really tight, really close to us. And when something is uncomfortable or counters those things we hold tight, we tend to put some distance between us and them. Yeah. And though, uh, again, may seem out of place to, to get into that two paragraphs into an essay about the first vision. But yeah, I'm already remembering uh, how I felt when I was reading this and recognizing those feelings. If you're listening or, or reading these things for the first time is super important because it can, those feelings can, if misinterpreted, stand in the way between you and really greater understanding of, of the source material and, and um, how things happened. Okay. Let's get to the 
to the next paragraph. I'll go ahead and read it. The various accounts of the first vision tell a consistent story, though naturally they differ in emphasis and detail. Historians expect that when an individual retells an experience in multiple settings to different audiences over many years, each account will emphasize various aspects of the experience and contain unique details. Indeed, differences similar to those in the first vision accounts in, exist in the multiple scriptural accounts of Paul's vision on the road to Damascus and the apostles' experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. Yet despite the differences, a basic consistency remains across all the accounts of the first vision. Some have mistakenly argued that any variation in the retelling of the story is evidence of fabrication. To the contrary, the rich historical record enables us to learn more about this remarkable event than we could if it were less well documented. Again, a lot to a lot to unpack there. Um, Bill, what do you think about that first sentence where it says that the, the various accounts tell a consistent story? So this paragraph uh, causes some anxiety inside me. Because as you put, there's a ton to unpack and there's lots of perspectives going on. There are various experts in the field and this paragraph paints it uh, very simply like, hey, these are what the experts think and the critics say this, but the experts are right. And and to to be honest, the experts are all over the place. When we say in this first sentence, the idea that this tells a consistent story, these four accounts, the the reality is that that's very much... um, debatable and up to the reader. There are four first vision accounts that are considered firsthand accounts. Even that gets messy because only one of the accounts is actually in Joseph Smith's own handwriting. Uh, The other three are not. As we talk about the idea that these are consistent, the reality is if we sit down and we read the 1832 account, the 1835, the 1838, and the 1842, there are things that are consistent. Joseph has a spiritual experience, for instance. Uh, What that spiritual experience looked like, what were his motives for going uh, into the grove that day, how old he was, what's going on in the religious context of his culture, uh, what the answer is from the heavenly being or heavenly beings. In other words, in one account, there's only one being. And again, I know the church will kind of want to, to push against that a little bit. Uh, In the other accounts, there are two beings that show up. And so I think when one sits down with all of this, uh, the idea that there's a consistent story, well, there are things that are consistent, and there are other things that are not consistent. And And again, I think that painting this story as black and white, like it is consistent or it isn't, uh, I don't think does the issue justice. I think a, an examination of these accounts imposes on us that we've got to at least step into the space that maybe these aren't as consistent as this essay wants them to be. That last point that you just made, Bill, that's when I read this, I think that's where the anxiety comes from, is understanding that uh, really this paragraph is it's telling me how to feel before it even gets into the differences in the accounts. And that, that's difficult for me at this point, but I understanding that if, if someone's reading this for the first time, they don't know the differences of the account. They're being told that it's consistent before the emphasis and detail and variation in emphasis and detail are, are presented. Um, they also appeal to authority, like you mentioned. I, if I'm going into this not knowing anything about the other accounts, I'm told right at the get-go right here that uh, historians expect it to be different. And uh, also points at the, um, the critics to say that they mistakenly argue. So I, I, I'm being painted into this our side versus their side type of, of mindset before I even know anything about the different accounts and the, the details that are, that are found therein. Anthony, um, anything in this paragraph you'd like to touch on? I know there's a few other notes that, that Bill and I have made as well. Yeah, there, there are two things really that stood out for me. Um, number one, they say historians expect when an individual retells an experience. And then they refer to uh, Paul's vision on the road to Damascus and the apostles' experience on the Mount, Transfigur- Mount of Transfiguration. And those aren't multiple retellings from the same individual. And, and, and so that felt off to me 
it, it'd be like going and talking to witnesses of an accident on the on the on a street corner, and and asking one individual to tell the account over time, and and looking for consistencies in what that single individual says, and versus asking multiple individuals that were there. And then getting upset because there was variation between what the multiple individuals said. So, so Paul didn't write the book of Acts. Uh, whoever wrote Luke uh, wrote the book of Acts. So to compare Paul's vision as it's explained in Acts versus, you know, in one of Paul's epistles, that that's like asking two different witnesses of an accident for their story and then saying, see, they're, they're different. So that felt a little off to me. And then this saying that they say some mistakenly have argued uh, that any variation in retelling of a story is evidence of fabrication. And I, and I don't, I don't perceive that any critic or any scholar here is saying that because there's any change in the word or variation that it's all a fabrication. They're they're pointing to specific contradictions or or differences uh, in, in what's being told, not just saying on a wholesale basis because there's any vari- variation that there's embellishment or fabrication. And so those are two things that really made this paragraph uh, uncomfortable for me when I read it. Yeah, this this is called a red herring, right? Like when we. When we set the critic up as having said something and then we uh, refute that criticism, when in reality the critic didn't say that at all. I think all uh, intelligent, informed human beings expect there to be a certain level of variation when witnesses are uh, sharing their witness about an experience or an event. I remember being in college in a psychology class and Uh, there was an experiment done where somebody came into the room and took an item and left. And then the class was asked to describe the person and people got what kind of pants color he had wrong. People got shirt color wrong. We expect variation in some of the detail at the same time. If I get right to the point, if one account is and again, this may be debatable, but if one account is clearly saying the only one heavenly person had showed up, and other accounts say that two being showed up, that detail then becomes a little too strong for me anyway to simply just reconcile and say, oh, no big deal. I think some details can be can vary, and I think some details get almost to be too much. They get up to kind of this, this point of no return. And so I think we ought to honor when the critic says, like, look, some of these details seem pretty serious in, in being different in these accounts. And I think we have to, again, sit with that a little bit and try to understand where the critic is coming from and why. Thanks. And Bill, you just spoiled one of the one of the differences. One versus two personages. It's in the next paragraph. So it's not like you spoiled a Avengers movie or something. So why don't you read uh, the next two paragraphs that that introduce the different accounts, and specifically the 1832 account. Each account of the first vision by Joseph Smith and his contemporaries has its own history and context that influenced how the event was recalled, communicated, and recorded. These accounts are discussed below. 1832 account. The earliest known account of the first vision, the only account written in Joseph Smith's own hand, is found in a short, unpublished, autobiography Joseph Smith produced in the second half of 1832. In the account, Joseph Smith described his consciousness of his own sins and his frustration at being unable to find a church that matched the one he had read about in the New Testament, and that would lead him to redemption. He emphasized Jesus Christ's atonement and the personal redemption it offered. He wrote that, quote, the Lord, unquote, appeared and forgave him of his sins. As a result of the vision, Joseph experienced joy and love, though, as he noted, he could find no one who believed his account. And then there's a link there for anybody who's reading along to click that and to read uh, a typed out text of that vision. But you can also look at the actual document, the 1832 account uh, as well. Thanks, Bill. Is it 
I actually don't quite know how I feel about about this. I, understanding that there is a link that that goes out to the actual account. Why wouldn't why wouldn't they just put the the words of the account here? Is it a is it a word count issue with with the essay itself? What do you what do you think? Um, I think it would certainly be helpful. I think the church in these essays, uh, there was points at which you had to click extra buttons to be able to read the entire essay. I think the church is trying its best to allow people to only go as far into the issue as they want to and to not put it in their face. And so if someone wants to just read this and go like, okay, that solves the issue and, and they can then step away and go back to their life. Whereas other people who say like, okay, I really want to know what these differences are. I really want to understand why the critic sees an issue here. Now they they can now click and go in and read it. It feels like that kind of thing to me. Great. Thanks. Anthony, what do you see about the 1832 account uh, that is striking, uh, whether it's in the actual words of the account or in the paragraph that we that Bill just read for us? Um, well, like I had mentioned earlier, um, I, I would have thought that uh, if if the brethren believed that it wasn't a problem, that the text uh, would have been included in Truth Restored and Our Heritage and things like that. And um, even if even if the text was included with annotations, you know, to to try to talk about uh, the implications of Joseph just saying the Lord appeared to him or where Joseph writes that after study he had concluded that there weren't uh, churches that had the truth on the earth. Uh, certainly when I read the 1832 account, clicked the link, read the actual text of the 1832 account, I, I was experiencing dissonance because it was only the Lord who appeared. The reason uh, was the, uh, the object of, of his prayer wasn't to determine which church was true because he had already decided what church was true. And, and then, you know, I'm, I'm going back and thinking, maybe even in, in Spanish, uh, where in the official account, in the eight, 1838 account, um, it, it, it says, for at this time it had never entered into my heart that they were all wrong. Um, that didn't match with the text in, in the 1832 account. So um, as I was going through these, it was incrementally causing additional amounts of dissonance because, you know, some of the things that we pointed out seem to be selectively parsing a faithful narrative. And then, and then this explanation of the 1832 account, and then I read the 1832 account and, and ran in, into those different things. But I do think, you know, like I mentioned before, confirmation bias, that, it, you know, if someone's never driven a Honda Accord, if they've only driven Jeeps, and that's primarily what they see on the road, and they, uh, you know, if we compare this to, the, to, to this essay, and they read through this, then maybe they don't click on that link and go to the 1832 account. Or even if they go to the 1832 account, maybe due to how we experience confirmation bias, it doesn't even phase them that in that 1832 account, it, there's only one, it appears to be only one being uh, appearing to Joseph and, uh, and that Joseph had already decided that it had entered into his heart that the church, other churches weren't true. And his, the object of his prayer, you know, wasn't primarily to figure out which church was true because he had already decided. So um, it, it's just fascinating to me that people can read up to where we've read so far, read the text of the 1832 account and have such a, a different spectrum of experience reading these exact same things. Um, and I want to add just another thing, which is the, I know some folks say like, look, Sunday school is an hour long. We, we need to keep things simple. We need to make sure that the members of the church have faith building experiences and, and to some degree, I agree with that, but let's take it one step further, which is if we go back to the college manual for church history, and I don't know that this is used anymore today, but it was used as of just a couple of years ago. This is called Church History in the Fullness of Times. This would be the 
the, essentially the college manual the church would have used at BYU for its church history classes. Uh, and, and in this chapter on the first vision, it completely uses the 1838 and 1842 account, which, by the way, share uh, significant portions. It's essentially the 1842 account. We'll get to this, obviously, as a synopsis of the 38. The, the text of this manual uh, only uses the 1838 account. There's no mention of the 1832. There's really not a conversation of the 1835. And so if you're in a college class at BYU on the history of the church, you are left with the 1838 account in your mind as the only version of Joseph Smith's experience in that grove. One other thing that, that popped out at me is that very last paragraph, he could find no one who believed his account. Uh, it it kind of dawned on me when I read this of, oh, the first account that we have, and actually the only one that's written in Joseph's hand is in 1832. That's uh, 12 years after the account. I, I don't think it's fair to to say that Joseph should be expected to write it down after it happens. Um, I'm a bad example. I actually was a pretty adamant journaler or diarist um, when I was a teenager, but I don't, I, I don't like the criticism that, that it should have been written down by Joseph beforehand. But when the, the problem that I do have or something that was difficult for me is when you look at, at who was talking about the first, first vision account before 1832. And there there isn't any mention of it, not by his mother, not by his, um, not by his siblings. And even that could be explained away if you didn't have accounts of him talking about the gold plates, talking about, um, his vision of Moroni. Uh, and when you, when you see that people in his family were talking about Joseph's experience with, with Moroni and getting the plates, it's very, it's a lot more noticeable and it's a lot less explainable to see that absence of anything about the first vision, something that, as we've talked about, has been built up to be the seminal moment of the restoration. I want to add one more thing, which I, I've heard people try to soften this by saying that, you know, Joseph would have been hesitant to tell his experience because he, there was a lot of uh, folks who were ready to dismiss him and to dismiss the, uh, the, the, the things he was espousing, even with violence. Uh, but my pushback to that would be that this, again, is written in 1832. This is two years after the church is even organized. The church is already going. It's already moving along. So when Joseph writes this story in his journal, everything is already in motion. It seems like this would be a beautiful place in his own private letter book, his own private journal here, for him to tell the story just as it happened. And so the fact that it's in these private writings, and maybe he intended to publish these someday or not, but since the church is already off the ground, it felt to me like this would have been the most beautiful place in the world to tell his experience in full. And yet, for whatever reason, this experience is, in, at least to me, in some ways, very different from the official account. Anthony, could you read the 1835 account, or at least the paragraph in the essay? Uh, 1835 account. In the fall of 1835, Joseph Smith recounted his first vision to Robert Matthews, a visitor to Kirtland, Ohio. The retelling recorded in Joseph's journal by his scribe, Warren Parrish, emphasizes his attempt to discover which church was right. The opposition he felt as he prayed and the appearance of one divine personage who was then shortly followed by another divine, uh, another personage, I suppose is what it's saying. Uh, this account also uh, notes the appearance of angels in the vision. So Bill, who's this Robert Matthews fella that, that is mentioned here? <laughs> so he's an interesting guy. You could, if for anybody who's listening, just go onto Wikipedia uh, type in Robert Matthews or Joshua the Jewish minister. This this man. That's a catch of your name right there. It is, and he even claims at times to be the resurrected Matthew from the four Gospels, uh, and goes under the name Matthias. And so this man had. Uh, there's quite an interesting story here. He had committed some violent acts, or at least believed to be. Uh, he was being pursued at times by law enforcement. 
He moved around a lot so as to stay uh, out of their out of their ability to capture him. And he went under various aliases. He considered himself a spiritual messenger. And so at times he would uh, promote himself as Joshua, the Jewish minister, and go around preaching from place to place. And at other times he claimed to be the resurrected Matthew from the Gospels and went under the name Matthias. He proposed that he had direct communication with God and that he had a message for God's children. And so here's Joseph Smith, one man claiming to be a prophet, sitting down in the same home with Joshua, the Jewish minister, Robert Matthews, and essentially they're both sharing their experiences with each other. And I kind of picture a little game of kind of one-upsmanship where one is trying to say like, look, I talked to God and here's the experiences I've had. And then Joseph recounts to him his experiences, uh, essentially saying like, I I know you, you propose that this is who you are, but let me tell you what real spiritual experiences look like. And uh, a scribe in the home, and I forget what the name of the scribe is, Warren Parrish, they say it there in the article. Um, Warren Parrish acts as a scribe and is essentially recording Joseph's version of his spiritual experience uh, as he uh, speaks to this Robert Matthews guy. Yeah, and, and Anthony, what if we look at the difference between the two accounts that we've that we've read we it, I, the thing that jumps out to me and maybe you can talk to this anthony is it says the appearance of one divine personage who was followed shortly by another is it interesting odd um not a problem for you what did you think when you read oh it the writing of this account doesn't doesn't attribute who are these two people what did they say it, it doesn't quite explain who they were yeah, so that's a little bit different because if there was this kind of one upsmanship uh, from this with this Robert Matthews, I, number one, the question would be why wouldn't Joseph would have identified who those personages were? So they're anonymous uh, in, in this account, uh, you know. And then of course the angels stand out. And then, of course, uh, in, in this particular account, uh, the reason for his prayer uh, isn't to seek, uh, you know, redemption or forgiveness for sins, but it's to discover which church is right. Um, so, so there are those kinds of differences. I, I feel like I could navigate those a little bit. If I go back to my discussion about cognitive dissonance and confirmation bias in a shelf, um, Back in 1997 or so, after I had moved to Billings, um, our elders quorum uh, instructor um, decided to teach us the uh, lectures on faith uh, in in elders quorum. And I was the first counselor in the elders quorum presidency at the time. And uh, we ran across lecture on faith number five uh, that uh, maybe is beyond the discussion today, but it presents kind of a different view of the Godhead, uh, lecture on faith number five, and and those were from 1835. So that was part of what I had shelved. I I had shelved all these passages from the Book of Mormon and the doctrine, early uh, sections of the Doctrine and Covenants and so forth that uh, don't make the characteristics of the Godhead as we uh, teach them today very clear. And um, that caused dissonance, and so those were heavy things on my shelf. And so the 1832 account was like cracking my shelf because uh, there isn't a, a clear, I mean, there's one being kind of thing. But then here in this 1835 account, all of a sudden there's two beings that are anonymous, as, as it seems like. There are angels, which is a little bit weird but um, and different, but probably not shelf cracking. Um, but you just kind of add all these things together with shelves that I already had that were pretty heavy um, with a, with what I perceived as uh, kind of a unclear uh, expression of the characteristics of divinity uh, in the early years of the church. And, and this was stretching for me. It should also be noted that just as we said in the very beginning, that the 1832 account was excised out of the letter book and stored away and was known at least by one person, if not more, within the church history department as a peculiar account that that they didn't want the public to be aware of on some level. 
1835 account is actually in, uh, it's also missing in action for almost the exact same time period. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's any intention of it being out of the public awareness. It was uh, in the six volume set, which it's, today it's a six volume set of the history of the church. It was compiled by B.H. Roberts. And uh, that manuscript uh, essentially had this 1835 account in it. At some point, that 1835 account is taken out and then put back into the back of that manuscript upside down. And it simply just wasn't, as far as I know, again, I don't think there was any negative intentional, you know, negative motives or anything like that. Uh, it just happened to be gone during the exact same time period that the 32 account was gone, rediscovered again in the mid 1960s when it was discovered, I believe, by Dean Jesse uh, in the back of this manuscript upside down. And, and so now today we have it, but to recognize that for a large portion of our church uh, moving along uh, the timeline as it was restored in 1830 and here we are today in 2019, that these two first accounts were essentially completely unavailable. All right, let's move on to that 1838 account. Uh, I'll read the, the following paragraph. I get the easy one, the one everyone's familiar with. 1838 account. The narration of the first vision best known to Latter-day Saints today is the 1838 account. First published in 1842 in the Times and Seasons, the church's news newspaper in Nauvoo, Illinois, the account was part of a longer history dictated by Joseph Smith between periods of intense opposition. Whereas the 1832 account emphasizes the more personal story of Joseph Smith as a young man seeking forgiveness, the 1838 account focuses on the vision as the beginning of the rise and progress of the church. Like the 1835 account, the central question of the narrative is which church is right? The timing of this account, oh, I'm no longer reading the essay. <laughs> the timing of this account, 1838, when it was written, what was going on in the church in 1838? Why would there need to be such an emphasis on the focus on uh, which church is right when this is being written down? Um, we didn't really take notes on this, but Anthony, are, are you familiar with, in general, at a high level, what's going on in 1838 with the church? Yeah, so so by this time, there's a significant amount of... Uh, there had been a significant amount of apostasy in the church. Um, the witnesses had left. Several of the senior um, apostles uh, and other leaders of the church had left. Um, there was the, the, the anti-bank kind of failure thing that was going on. Um, so... It, 1838 was a messy period of time. Um, and so uh, I don't necessarily know that that would be the motivation for for doing this, but um, it does seem, you know, like it, it's interesting that if somebody were trying to reestablish their claim of authority and so forth, um, that that would be an additional... Uh, motivation to to do this. I, I think that that Bill might explain too um, what B Richard Bushman has expressed in terms of who were the scribes uh, for this 1838 account and how different the language is in the 1838 account uh, in, in in terms of that it, it was not necessarily. A, a parsed, dictated thing in the kind of language that Joseph Smith might have used as well. I learned this later as I took a deeper dive into reading these different accounts and then searching on Wikipedia and other scholarship as well. Bill, can you give us a rundown of that Richard Bushman quote? For those that don't know uh, Richard Bushman, um, more widely known as the author of Rust Stone Rolling, he uh, has a much wider history than that but faithful Latter-day Saint uh, still to this day. But uh, I was very impressed with his quote here as well. Could you walk us through that? Yeah, he's not only a historian who is essentially known as like one of the top two or three guys, if you want to know something about the life of Joseph Smith. Uh, he's a faithful, as you point out, faithful member of the church, uh, former stake president, 
Uh, he currently holds the office of patriarch, although I think he's uh, inactive in that role. Uh, but he is an active, faithful Latter-day Saint. He just moved from the location where he was a patriarch. And so in his new stake, there's already a patriarch there. And the policy is then to make the moving patriarch essentially inactive um, in terms of their calling. The quote from Richard Bushman is as follows. Uh, He says, I am very much impressed by Joseph Smith's 1832 history account of his early visions. This is the one partially written in his own hand and the rest dictated to Frederick G. Williams. I think it is more revealing than the official account, presumably written in 1838 and contained in the Pearl of Great Price. We don't know who wrote the 1838 account. Joseph's journal indicates that he, Sidney Rigdon, and George Robinson collaborated on beginning the history in late April, but we don't know who actually drafted the history. It is a polished narrative, but unlike anything Joseph ever wrote himself. The 1832 history we know is his because of the handwriting. It comes rushing forth from Joseph's mind in a gush of words that seem artless and uncalculated, a flood of raw experience. I think this account, the 1832 he's speaking of, this account has the marks of an authentic visionary experience. This is the distance from God, the perplexity and yearning for answers, the perplexity and the experience itself, which brings intense joy, followed by fear and anxiety. Can he deal with the powerful force he has encountered? Is he worthy and able? It is a classic announcement of a prophet's call, and I find it entirely believable. What now? And I'm stepping away from now from that quote. What Richard Bushman is essentially saying is he personally, as an expert, by the way, as a historian, as a informed individual who knows as much about Joseph Smith as just about anyone, he is saying I give preference to the 1832 account as uh, more likely the the more accurate telling of Joseph Smith's experience over the 1838 and 1842 accounts. So that causes me a little bit of dissonance, right? Because um, I had all these spiritual experiences related to teaching and quoting verbatim, word for word, this 1838 account that, that scholar and historian Richard Bushman indicates was maybe more polished and significantly influenced by Sidney Rigdon and George Rob- Robinson. So um, anyway, another thing to crack my shelf in my experience of reading. And I think it's just, you know, again, noting you guys have all, you both said it as well as Bushman said it. The 1838 account is not in Joseph Smith's writing style. It's not in his handwriting. It's not the kind of language he would have used. It's not the kind of vocabulary he had. And, and so to recognize on some level, there are other people sitting with Joseph and collaborating about what they want this message to be. What do we want to tell the world? How do we want to explain that this church has authority and it's been restored? How do we want to proclaim our message or our mission statement about who we are and why we are? And, and I think we ought to make some space that some of the input would have had and and appears to have, and and again, the historians agree, uh, some impact on what the details and emphasis of this message uh, ended up being. Let's go ahead and read that 1842 account. Uh, Anthony, could you read that for us? Sure. 1842 account, uh, written in response to Chicago Democrat editor John Wentworth's request for information about the Latter-day Saints. This account was printed in the Times and Seasons, 1842. And then it says in parentheses, though, the Wentworth letter, as it is commonly known, is also the source for the Articles of Faith. Uh, And then it says, uh, the account intended for publication to an audience unfamiliar with Mormon beliefs is concise and straightforward. As with earlier accounts, Joseph Smith noted the confusion he experienced and the appearance of two personages in answer to his prayer. The following year, Joseph Smith sent this account with minor modifications to a historian named Israel Daniel Roop, who published it as a chapter in his book, um, Epasa Ecclesia, 
Is that the whole, to, basically to the whole church? I don't speak Latin. That's why I didn't uh, take this paragraph. Uh, good job. Oh, there we go. Uh, <laughs> an original, uh, the subtitle of the book is An Original History of the Religious Denominations at Present Existing in the United States. All right. What to say about the 1842 account? It, uh, it should be noted it's the very first one that is in the public awareness. Uh, it essentially is just borrowing from this 1838 account, although the 1838 account um, isn't quite published yet. It's just written in 1838. 1842 then takes a, a chunk of that, along with other details, and then passes them on to the Chicago Democrat and then makes their way into this, uh, this Israel Daniel Root book. Um, I, I, I think two things. One is just to recognize when we say the 1838 and the 1842 account are separate accounts, in reality, they really aren't. They're really the, the same account. Uh, the other thing that should be noted is I, I didn't like one sentence in there which talks about, as with earlier accounts, Joseph Smith noted the confusion he experienced in the appearance of two personages in answer to his prayer. Even here, it feels like this is written in a way as to almost kind of get you to forget about there was one personage in that 32 account. It seems like it would have been more forthright to say in that sentence, uh, to distinguish that at least one of the accounts doesn't say there are two personages. And again, I know the church wants to push back and say, look, if we read it with the conclusion in mind, we can see that perhaps when Joseph uses the Lord opened the heavens and I saw the Lord, that he actually was speaking of two beings but that doesn't feel like the most rational, logical way to read that 1832 account. And I wish they simply would have made a little space here to acknowledge that that, that uh, is the case. Yeah, it's kind of fixing the, the issue before they introduce the issue, which they're about to do the next section of the, uh, and we won't jump quite there yet, but the next section, talk, section excuse me, talks about the common arguments. So they're almost solving the argument before it's presented. Um, it feels like a good way to, to solve an issue is, is fix it before, it, before it's even brought up. The, the next little uh, section is about the secondhand accounts. It doesn't focus on them. I'll read that quickly. Uh, besides these accounts from Joseph Smith himself, five accounts were written by contemporaries who heard Joseph speak about the vision. Read these accounts here, and there is a link. Um, I don't have any notes um, to dig into those. Uh, do either of you have any anything to say about the secondary accounts? Some of them are are quite scant. Uh, there, there, not a lot of detail there. The fact that they are secondhand accounts, I think, even the critics have essentially uh, not found any serious issues within those. And I don't think there's a whole lot of detail to add inside of those. And so for me, they're kind of a secondary uh, thing going on just to add context and information. But they're really not where the critic or the defender of the faith uh, is is staking out their argument. Yeah, that, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I think one of the kind of side notes about talking about secondhand uh, accounts with others talking about the first vision, um, where it, it actually does create a little bit of concern for me is, is how some people, especially prominent people in the church did talk about the, the first vision, uh, with Joseph. Um, for example, I mean, we have, we have some quotes from, from people like Brigham Young, who su succeeded Joseph in the Brighamite church, at least the LDS church that came out here to Utah. And he talks about uh, an angel appearing to, to Joseph, um, and this many years after, after Joseph, uh, John Taylor also talks about an angel. George Albert Smith talks about, uh, an angel appearing to Joseph. Joseph's own mother talks about an angel appearing to Joseph. So though there are some second accounts that are not being spoke of here, um, of people long after Joseph had passed talking about the experience that Joseph shared with them. And without getting into too much detail, just based on time, you can go look those up, um, they, it's very clear they are referring to the first vision. They talk about Joseph asking which denomination was right and which one he was joined, and an angel telling him that he should not join any of them. So I think that, that in more than any other point, for me at least, it, it shows me the, where the emphasis was being 
output the the emphasis on the first vision is is much more heightened today than it was uh back then it it wasn't presented as this um, seminal super important experience really moroni was that important experience and that has shifted yeah yeah in fact to add to that uh, we ought to recognize one one of the things you're pointing out here is there really are very few secondhand accounts uh, and there are a few like you point out that aren't included and I want to make note I will make sure at the end of this episode in the footnotes of the episode if you if you are looking on you know the internet and seeing the the synopsis and what's going to be discussed below that we'll put a ton of resources where people can read more and we can link to some of these accounts that are not being mentioned. We can uh, link to various articles about the 1832 account being cut out and so that people can read more and learn more as they're going along. The other thing to notice, as you just mentioned, the first vision is not really part of our cultural narrative from the time of Joseph Smith until I think 1961, when for the very first time, the first vision is officially put into our proselyting material. And and I know that seems odd. Like I, I joined the church in 1996. Uh, and when I joined the church in 96, the first vision feels like it is a huge part of our story. But to recognize that from 1961, all the way back to Joseph Smith, the first vision was not part of our missionary effort. It wasn't a tool to get people to join the church or to uh, inspire them to look into the church. Uh, it's not until the 1960s that that becomes part of our cultural narrative. Yeah, I I really wish that they would have had a paragraph on uh, on this particular thing on the degree to which uh, it was became well known, you, you know, how it became more known, when it became more emphasized, when it be got uh, put into church histories and lesson manuals and so forth, and when it ended up becoming kind of a lead thing in, in missionary work. I, I wish that they would have addressed that because it it, it seems to me like it leads the, be, uh, the reader to believe that in 1842, that everybody knew about it. It was one of the primary, you know, lead things in terms of uh, a witness or a testimony of Joseph Smith as a prophet uh, and so forth. And that's just not simply the case. There's a lot more complexity uh, in terms of the evolution over time, in terms of its emphasis and its recognition and its use uh, in the history of the church. Great. Uh, the essay now jumps into the arguments regarding the accounts of Joseph Smith's first vision. I'll read this kind of introductory first paragraph. I know that we've we've already gone through um, many of the problems that that we found that are go- about to be outlined by the essay here. So we'll do our best not to to rehash things that we've already talked about. But uh, it is introduced as such. Arguments regarding the accounts of Joseph Smith's first vision. The variety of num- and number of accounts of the first vision have led some critics to question whether Joseph Smith's descriptions match the reality of his experience. Two arguments are frequently made against his credibility. The first questions Joseph's memory of the events. The second questions whether he embellished elements of the story over time. I have to make a... I'm no longer quoting um, something that, man, it really... Uh, it affects me when I read this first sentence and it may not be immediately clear why some critics uh, question whether Joseph Smith's descriptions match the reality of his experience, the way that that's presented. And you guys tell me, does this seem nitpicky to me? But I read that and I think, man, if, if I read these accounts and I question if Joseph Smith's descriptions, if they actually match the reality of experience, that makes me a critic. There's no room for, for someone with, with faith and that believes to have any kind of question, because if they do, this essay paints them as a critic. Is that a, is that a fair thing to think? Like, that's what I think when I read that. It, to be honest, I mean, essentially, yes, I agree with you, but by that standard, Richard Bushman, who we just read a quote from, while being a faithful Latter-day Saint, who is, again, served as a stake president, served as a patriarch, uh, still active, faithful member, uh, by this standard, he would be a critic. Yeah, I mean, his quote is exactly that. It's it's 
pointing to the reality of his experiences and pointing to that 1832 account. That's a great point, Bill. Thanks. All right. Memory. Memory is the very first, uh, the, the one of two uh, issues that they, that they want to deal with here. Um, Anthony, I miss your reading voice. Can you, can you read that first paragraph of memory? Thank you. Yes. Memory. One argument regarding the accounts of Joseph Smith's first vision alleges that historical evidence does not support Joseph Smith's description of, re- of religious revivals or of religious revival in Palmyra, New York, and its vicinity in 1820. Some argue that this undermines both Joseph's claim of unusual religious fervor and the account of the vision itself. Why don't we keep going? Let's just read that the next one. They're quite related. Documentary evidence, however, supports Joseph Smith's statements regarding the revivals. The region where he lived became famous for its religious fervor and was unquestionably one of the hotbeds of religious revivals. Historians refer to the region as the, quote, burned over district, unquote, because preachers wore out the land holding camp revivals and seeking converts during the early 1800s. In June 1818, for example, a Methodist camp meeting took place in Palmyra, and the following summer, Methodists assembled again at Vienna, which is now Phelps, New York, 15 miles from the Smith family farm. The journals of an itinerant uh, Methodist preacher document much religious excitement in Joseph's geographic area in 1819 and 1820. They report that Reverend George Lane, a revivalist Methodist minister, was in that region in both years, speaking, quote, on God's method in bringing about reformations, unquote. This historical evidence is consistent with Joseph's description. He said that the unusual religious excitement in his district or region, quote, commenced with the Methodists, unquote. Indeed, Joseph stated that he became, quote, somewhat partial, unquote, to Methodism. Thanks, Anthony. So before we get into the details, it talks a lot about what's going on with the Methodists um, in that time of 1819, 1820, that time frame. Uh, Bill, can you talk to us a little bit about memory in general? It's it's a tricky topic. So a couple things here. First off, memory. Um, what I'll do, I'll link to a, a podcast episode that has nothing to do with Mormonism that goes into wonderful detail about memory and how tricky it can be. Uh, the more we recount an experience, the more we sit down and tell an experience to somebody else, the more our memory gets distorted about that experience. So while we think like, look, let me keep it refreshed. Let me always remember it. Let me always recall it. Let me tell people this story all the time. But if you pick the stories that you tell the most about your life and your experience, those stories are absolutely distorted. Now, nobody's going to acknowledge that. We don't know it. We sit with our stories and we think like, oh, yeah, I got that tricycle on my fourth birthday and this is what I did with it. And here's what I this is how my life looked. And here's what I got on my 15th birthday. And it was this color. And I remember my first girlfriend. Here was what the our first date looked like. Any of those events in our life that we recall often or think about often We don't even know it, but the memory is distorted. Now, I want to say something here about this specific paragraph. There are lots of concerns in these accounts about Joseph Smith's memory and why there are differences among the various accounts. For some reason, the the church chose to ignore all of those and to focus entirely in this section on the revivals. I think that's intentional because the revivals is maybe the easiest of all of these memory issues to have a conversation about. The critics have had debates in the past, and there are articles written that debate where these revivals were held and what years they were held. And the critic tries to make the argument that, look, Joseph says there were revivals just before he goes into the grove. And if revivals happened four years earlier or three years after, we have some sort of problem. The church has accumulated a handful of documents that show that there was some significant religious excitement in the area. Uh, Some of them 
a little bit of time distance away, but not enough to cause concern. Other ones are right in the exact time period they should be, but they're 18 or 28 or 35 miles away. And so the issue becomes uh, not that big. It, it, it probably isn't going to be the issue that's going to hurt anybody's faith in the church. And it seems like an easy place for them to focus their attention. When it comes to memory, I have a lot more concerns with these accounts than the religious revivals. And for whatever reason, and I do think on some level intentional, the church chose not to go into any of those. Yeah, thanks. That It kind of reminds me of the, the Paul H. Dunn stories of, you know, as time goes on and you retell those stories, um, what did he actually believe? What did Paul H. Dunn believe actually happened? He very well could have believed it happened. In fact, <laughs> I'll detour us for two seconds because this is, this is kind of fun. I worked in a movie theater when I was 17 in Santa Barbara, California, right next to Montecito, where a lot of wealthy celebrities live. And they would come down every so often and go to a movie there. And one day I was, uh, and I'm fessing up to some some embellishment myself here, but I'm just, as you walk through that bill, it, it really, it, it hit me that I'm guilty of this as well. But while I was working the concession stand one day, uh, Rob Lowe walked out of South Park, the movie, went in, I'm dating myself a smidge, walked into the restroom, and as he walked out, he walked by a theater that was playing Austin Powers 2. And he looked at the door, smiled, and shook his head. And in that moment, I realized Rob Lowe was in Austin Powers 2, and I could hear his voice on the screen. So Rob Lowe, imagine just how funny that would be for him to walk by a movie, back, going back to the movie he's there to watch, and he hears his voice coming from a different theater. Well, as I retold that story, I added some details and I lied. I mean, straight up, I lied. But the power of it is in my mind, I had an I had an interaction with Rob where he went into the theater and I followed him into the theater and telling him you're not allowed to skip theaters. I had built this story in my mind. And as I retold that story over the past 15 years, it becomes more and more detailed. But the reality is. He was just walking by and heard his voice on the screen. Does that make any sense? Yeah, he just took a little glimpse in to see what was going on. I wish I would have went and talked to him. I really like him, especially in Parks and Rec. He's really good in Parks and Recreation. Anyway, all right, let's get back to the, to the fun stuff. No, I, I, I did have a note that, that relates directly to um, what you were talking about with the, the revivals themselves, because the, the historical account presents uh, some messiness around that. Um, William Smith, uh, Joseph's brother, talks about the revivals being in 1823, um, and that's when when Joseph was was confused and not knowing which denomination he could go to, and and that was written in 1841. William Smith wrote that. Lucy Mack Smith wrote in 1844 that the revivals and the interest in the family uh, uh, finding the denominations were after Alvin's death, which was in November of 1823. Oliver Cowdery in 1835 also places that religious excitement in 1823. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of contemporary before Joseph died accounts that this religious um, excitement was was occurring a few years after, really in line with that Moroni story. And, and to note confirmation bias, which Anthony spoke on earlier, the church is only giving you one side of the conversation, which is here's the evidence that shows that there were religious revivals near Joseph in time, as well as in geography. And in reality, it completely ignores the evidence, even that from the early members of the church, even that from the family members of Joseph Smith, uh, in regards to this, that contradict that narrative. And so the reader needs to understand, like it or not, comfortable with it or not, the church is intentionally sharing a biased perspective and intentionally ignoring evidence that runs counter to the things they are talking about. Right. And when you get deeper into it, then you also discover that post-1820, Joseph was officially on the rolls of a Methodist Sunday school uh, group, too. So, so it, it's messy because... 
because of the the confirming external evidence uh, of these family members uh, placing this event maybe not in 1820 as well as uh, Joseph Smith uh, participating in a Methodist congregation as officially on the rolls of a Sunday school uh, class there too. So, Right, and that's important, Anthony, because you have Joseph Smith associating with a Methodist congregation after he claims Heavenly Father and Jesus told him not to associate with any of them. Right, that, that would be... Uh, you would think if God said, don't join any of them, that you wouldn't sign up for a Methodist Sunday school class, you know, but he did. Yeah. Uh, the next section talks about embellishment. Bill, could you read that first paragraph? Embellishment. The second argument frequently made regarding the accounts of Joseph Smith's first vision is that he embellished his story over time. This argument focuses on two details, the number and identity of heavenly beings. Joseph Smith stated that he saw Joseph's first vision accounts describe the heavenly beings with greater detail over time. The 1832 account says, The Lord opened the heavens upon me, and I saw the Lord. His 1838 account states, I saw two personages, one of whom introduced the other as my beloved son. As a result, critics have argued that Joseph Smith started out reporting to have seen one being, the Lord, and ended up claiming to have seen both the Father and the Son. There are other, more consistent ways of seeing the evidence. A basic harmony in the narrative across time must be acknowledged at the outset. Three of the four accounts clearly state that two personages appeared to Joseph Smith in the first vision. The outlier is Joseph Smith's 1832 account, which can be read to refer to one or two personages. If read referring to one heavenly being, it would likely be the personage who forgave his sins. According to later accounts, the first divine personage told Joseph Smith to hear the second, Jesus Christ, who then delivered the main message, which included the message of forgiveness. Joseph Smith's 1832 account then may have concentrated on Jesus Christ, the bearer of forgiveness. Another way of reading the 1832 account is that Joseph Smith referred to two beings, both of whom he called the Lord. The embellishment argument hinges on the assumption that the 1832 account describes the appearance of only one divine being, but the 1832 account does not say that only one being appeared. Note that the two references to the Lord are separated in time. First, The Lord, in quotes, opens the heavens. Then Joseph Smith sees, quote, the Lord, unquote. This reading of the account is consistent with Joseph's 1835 account, which has one personage appearing first, followed by another soon afterwards. The 1832 account then can be reasonably, sorry, the 1832 account then can reasonably be read to mean that Joseph Smith saw one being who then revealed another, and that he referred to both of them as, quote, the Lord, unquote. Quote, the Lord opened the heavens upon me, and I saw the Lord, unquote. Joseph's increasingly specific descriptions can thus be compellingly read as evidence of increasing insight, accumulating over time based on experience. In part, the differences between the 1832 account and later accounts may have something to do with the differences between the written In the spoken word, the 1832 account represents the first time Joseph Smith attempted to write down his history. That same year, he wrote a friend that he felt imprisoned by paper, pen, and ink in a crooked, broken, scattered, and imperfect language. He called the written word a little narrow prison. The expansiveness of the later accounts is more easily understood and even expected when we recognize they were likely dictated accounts, an easy, comfortable medium for Joseph Smith, and one that allowed the words to flow more easily. I find it funny that um, <clears throat> that quote of Joseph writing in the same year that he wrote the 1832 account, paper, pen, and ink, and a crooked, broken, scattered, and imp- imperfect language, uh, a little narrow prison. Those are very eloquent written words. <laughs> um uh, describing it, it's just so funny that juxtaposition between he's trying to explain why the written language is so difficult for him and he does it in a really w- really great way. <laughs> 
it almost it almost hints of uh, Nephi writing in the Book of Mormon uh, about how uh, you know he could uh, influence people and speak with the power of God when he would speak with words, but he felt confined by his writing. So it's interesting that it hints to something like that. That's true. This entire embellishment um, paragraph or section is talking about the difference between one or two personages. Um, what do you think about uh, the argument there? Uh, so, I, so I would I would comment um, about this um, when when I read this portion of the essay, um, I, I would explain that my experience is somewhat parallel to my experience reading the Race and the Priesthood essay, which I look forward to speaking about uh, in, in another podcast uh, discussion. And that is, with the Race and the Priesthood essay, the problem was less the ban and more my perception of what it meant with regard to discernment uh, from the brethren and, dis- and discernment of spiritual experiences of the brethren. And in this case... It, it was less about dealing with this embellishment, and it was more about all my super heavy shelves of, of it being pretty clear uh, in my mind, but then causing dissonance that in First Nephi and in Mosiah and Alma and Mormon and Ether uh, and in early sections of the D, uh, DNC, and what I subsequently found out in terms of verses that were later edited in 1837 of 1 Nephi chapter 11, that there, there was very clearly, at least that as I read those uh, verses uh, in the canon, very clearly uh, a Trinitarian, almost modalistic um, view of divinity in the Book of Mormon, the JST, and the Doctrine and Covenants. And I shelved those things because um, they caused dissonance to me because I thought, well, if Joseph saw, not just saw, but was physically visited by two personages that were resurrected beings, then, then that wouldn't have made sense. Like he would have when he was translating the Book of Mormon, he would have like asked God about it. Like we have all these DNC sections where Joseph runs across things, and then he asks God for clarification, and then God gives him clarification. So in all these passages in the Book of Mormon that are are very Trinitarian or or, or modalistic, where God's the same built being, where 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 Jesus is also the the very Father. Uh, and so forth, uh, and an early DNC, that w- it just didn't make sense to me. And so this was huge on my shelf. And so my concern is less about reconciling these uh, differences or, or the embellishment, but that, that this cracked or even broke this shelf, uh, that there was an evolution of theology with regard to the characteristics of the Godhead. And as I mentioned before, uh, back in 1997, uh, our instructor in our elders quorum was teaching the lectures on faith, and so I was aware of the messiness of lecture on faith number five, where uh, where it teaches, and this was part of the Doctrine and Covenants until the early 1900s, in lecture on faith number five, where there are two beings, a personage of spirit and a personage of tabernacle, uh, uh, for the Father and then and then the Son, and that the Holy Ghost is their combined mind. Uh, so there were two beings in, in the Godhead in uh, in the 1835 uh, lecture on faith. So um, it's these ancillary things that crashed my shelves. That if people, you know, weren't carrying dissonance or shelving all this stuff that in the same way that I was in terms of the Book of Mormon and the early DNC and in the JST that were Trinitarian, maybe they wouldn't have had the same experience that I did when I read the 1832 account and looked at this kind of evolution, apparent evolution over time of, of differences as matching up almost exactly to... Um, with the first vision accounts and the changes in the in in these accounts, with what appears to have been changes in evolution of theology of Joseph uh, over time. There's a sentence. There's that first paragraph with embellishment that I read. Then there's this next paragraph, and the first sentence says there are other, more consistent ways of seeing the evidence. 
It's a tricky sentence, and here's why. They're not suggesting that there is a more consistent way to see all the data. They're saying there's a way to keep the consistency of the narratives. In other words, if you don't want the 1832 account to conflict with the other accounts, here's how you do it, even if that's the weaker argument. This is how you keep them consistent. The trouble is that when you understand all of this, a lot of people are saying that's not the most logical, rational way to see all of these points of view and to see Joseph's four accounts. Uh, Anthony, as you mentioned, the theology of Joseph Smith as it shifts and changes in the background. Uh, When we add it uh, to what's going on in the Book of Mormon, as you pointed out as well, what we have to come to grips with is that Joseph's uh, version, his account of the first vision, seems to run side by side with what can be demonstrated as a fluid, changing theology about God, about the church, about who has authority, about what his role is uh, in the church. And when you juxtapose all those things together, the more consistent way to see the data for many is that Joseph is changing his telling of the story to match his changing theology and his changing authority and role in the church. What the article is saying is that in spite of that, if you want to keep these accounts consistent and hold to the narrative we taught you, here's the way you do it. Yeah, you know, that's that's my, been my experience as well. Um, without repeating what either of you just mentioned, it this entire conversation about embellishment really leaves me wanting there to be an essay on Joseph's understanding of the Godhead. That's the essay that I wish would have been written because that's really the core concern for me. That was what was most difficult for me was laying it out in chronological order from the Um, first edition of the Book of Mormon all the way through that 1842 account and looking at how the Godhead was talked about. Not all of those puzzle pieces are presented here in the First Vision essay. And really that's, to me, the more more concerning essay that should be written is how did did Joseph understand God the Father and Jesus uh, Christ his Son um, and if, and if it is one way, why, why did it change over time? Yeah. So that really brings the interesting question to me because my perception is I love the King Follett discourse, you know, as a missionary, I, I, I read it, uh, multiple times and since then, and, and there, it seems to me like there is a clear evolution of theology of the Godhead between, you know, some of these earlier accounts and, and the earlier sections of the DNC, all the way up to the King Follett discourse. And it makes me wonder, uh, and there's really no way to answer this, that if there was another uh, account of the first vision after or around uh, 1844, at the time of the King uh, Follett discourse, would it have been included, uh, you know, the question is, would it have included that additional evolution of theology that we end up with in the King Follett discourse? Would it have been that much different, you know? And, and uh, yeah, I think that would be an amazing essay to talk about. Um, and it could be done, I think, in a faithful way to talk about line upon line, precept upon precept, evolution and restoration of, of theology that I think the challenge is, is that that can then cause dissonance for people because we presented this narrative that in 1820, Joseph's theology about uh, the characteristics of the Godhead were fixed um, and they were consistent and everybody knew about it and nobody wanted to believe him and and, and and that's just not what the historical record shows. And so anyway, I agree with you. That would be a very helpful essay. It, it would also bring up the, the idea that some of Joseph's theology that came late in his life has not been adopted into the church and has essentially been swept under kind of the rug, kind of just dismissed. And that King Follett sermon is a great example of that. Lectures on faith uh, playing a part uh, as well. And, and when you... 
have a prophet who has line upon line, precept upon precept, and then he's getting things later in life, and you're saying like, ah, that doesn't make us comfortable. Let's kind of set that off to the side. I, I think that's going to be concerning as they if they tried to tackle such an essay. I think it would be healthier, though, uh, to to look at it from that standpoint. It would be less brittle to to talk about evolution of theology and restoration line upon line and things like that. So yeah, yeah, I you know when correlation. Um, really became defined in the early 70s, uh, we lost a lot of that. We lost a lot of the pontificating and a lot of the the, the interesting conversations about, about a lot of these topics. In fact, looking in the footnotes, we talked about this way at the beginning of the podcast. Um, Anthony, you mentioned the Improvement Era article from 1970 you couldn't find because that's that was pre-correlation. And so you can't find that on the, you can, I'm sure Google can find it, but you can't find it on the church website and in the, in the, in the app. It's somewhere in there, 1970 to 1972, when correlation happened, the leadership at that moment looked backwards and said, these are the things that we're going to accept the rest of it down the memory hole, right? Is the way to, the way to put it. So we have uh, any, any, any comments on that? Um, as we kind of get ready to hit the conclusion, my one thing would be, I would encourage anybody who's for the first time saying like, okay, I want to know this stuff. The suggestion would be start with the footnotes, start with the resources that we're going to leave at the end of the episode. Um, I would, I would want to recognize like the church wants to say it talked about this first vision all over the place, talked about the first vision all over the place. And the reality is it talked about it in maybe a handful of places, four, five, six, and what they share in those places is very limited. So for instance, there's a lot of times the church is holding up this James Allen article. And if you go and read it, the the question you have to ask is what are they sharing with me and what are they not sharing with me and why do they do those two things the way they do them? Uh, And also to recognize like there's lots of information out there. If you're just depending on your Sunday school lesson to tell you all of these things, that's not going to happen. And so if you want to know more about Joseph Smith's first vision, for instance, and the other essays as we get into them, you're going to have to chase down uh, different resources and source material, uh, which raises a lot of questions maybe in your mind of what you can trust and what you can't trust. I simply would say, like, get as far back to the original sources, who wrote those, whose journals they're in, whether that person is... uh, a member of the church, not a member of the church, and maybe an ex-member of the church. All of those things are going to carry biases for sure. But often where the critic is getting their material actually comes from the quotes of leaders and the early faithful members of the church. And I think all too often we've dismissed those resources out of hand as being quote unquote anti-Mormon, when in reality they came from the faithful in the very beginning to begin with. The last paragraph says, Conclusion. Joseph Smith testified repeatedly that he experienced a remarkable vision of God the Father and his Son Jesus Christ. Neither the truth of the first vision nor the arguments against it can be proven by historical research alone. Knowing the truth of Joseph Smith's testimony requires each earnest seeker of truth to study the record and then exercise sufficient faith in Christ to ask God in sincere, humble prayer whether the record is true. If the seeker asks with the real intent to act upon the answer revealed by the Holy Ghost, the truthfulness of Joseph Smith's vision will be be manifest. In this way, every person can know that Joseph Smith spoke honestly when he declared, quote, I had seen a vision, I knew it, and I knew that God knew it, and I could not deny it, end quote. The church acknowledges the contribution of scholars to the historical content presented in this article. Their work is used with permission. So that's how you know it's true, right? You, uh, and Anthony, you spoke about this a little earlier, about that spirit you had felt with your experiences with the first vision. Yeah. Um, well, I would mention that I, I thought it was a little bit weird that um, they don't – it acknowledges – the church acknowledges contribution of scholars, but it doesn't actually give attribution to scholars, which feels – coming from an academic background, that, that sounds uh, – I'm not quite sure how I feel about that. Why? Why wouldn't they have 
listed the individuals who made contributions uh, to this. But yeah, um, so that's tough. So so if you have spiritual experiences related to these things where you study and you exercise faith and you ask God in prayer um, and you have those spiritual types of experiences, wh- what does that mean? Do, does that mean that uh, Joseph saw one or two personages? Does it mean that it had entered into his heart uh, that the other churches weren't true or not? Um, does it mean that he saw angels uh, or he didn't as part of the experience or that the personages were more anonymous and unnamed or like some of his family members wrote that the personage personages were angels? You know, does angel also apply to members of the Godhead? You know, it, it, it just kind of gets messy. And um, and then the, the cracking of the shelf really includes that um, – Sometimes we have spiritual experiences that are real, but the, the, the real question is, to what extent are they really reliable divine witnesses of truth? Because as I read this and other essays, I recognized that I had spiritual experiences that were related to things that were partially or entirely inaccurate, and, and that uh, was the, probably the most stretching experience reading uh, the essays is because I recognized, at least for me, I had to reconstruct what my spiritual experiences were because they, I had spiritual experiences that related to things that were demonstrably, partially or entirely inaccurate. uh, and, And that made everything crumble for me. At least that was my experience as I was reading these. Yeah. You know, Looking at, thanks for for saying that and sharing that. You know, the the experience that I that I had with interpreting those spiritual experiences as well uh, becomes more troubling when I read one of these middle sentences in this last paragraph to study the record and then exercise sufficient faith in Christ, whether the record is true. And what I hear there is, if you do pray, and you don't receive an answer that these things are true. The implication is that you did not exercise sufficient faith in Christ, or you were not sincere and humble. I, it, it, I struggle with that. I struggle with, with the finger being pointed at me that if, if I don't come to the conclusion that this essay outlines, I don't have sufficient faith. I'm not being sincere. I'm not being humble. I'm trying to paint a picture for for the listener of why this why this is a concern. It says to study the record. Which one? Uh, all of it together. Uh, it it's it's all very very difficult, and it's outlined in a very easy to understand way. But it's as far as the prayer goes, it's a very simple equation. But it <laughs> all of this information makes that that very complicated and troublesome. Yeah, it comes off as approaching the no true Scotsman fallacy, right? No true Scotsman will drink, uh, will drink uh, rum, right? And so there's this idea that anybody who's drinking a, a glass of rum, for instance, is not a true Scotsman. Um, anytime we set up a litmus test where we've already decided, like, if you do this honestly, if you do this thoroughly, if you do your research, here's the conclusion you will come to then you've not made any safe space for somebody to have a spiritual experience or to have uh, the Holy Ghost within them, as Mormonism would impose, lead them anywhere other than the uh, approved answer. I, I, I would share that, um, you know, I have, I have many friends who have studied this material and they've been able to uh, develop faithful reconciliations, you know, that were different than mine. And, and they tend to be pretty nuanced. Uh, maybe they tend to be similar to what Richard Bushman expressed in that it's the 1832 account resonated with him, uh, that there, you know, that there probably was some sort of experience with the divine, whether it was physical or not, or whether it was visionary or some combination or in between, uh, there are people that can study this material and come up with some sort of nuanced rec- reconciliation that Joseph experienced 
uh, something uh, that was divine and and so forth, and they're able to reconcile it that way. But it seems like, from an apologetic standpoint, uh, the people that con- contributed to or edited this essay is trying to go beyond that to still emphasize or suggest that the 1838 account, because it's canonized and over and everything, we need to reconcile things to that standard as opposed to looking at it from a nuanced standpoint and just say, Joseph had an experience, um, maybe over time uh, his recollection of the experience got uh, embellished or added to based on the circumstances and... Um, you know, in any event, I just wanted to point that out, that some people are able to um, reconcile these things in a healthy way or a faithful way. Sure. Yeah, that's that's helpful to, to recognize. That's important. Absolutely. Well, we're just about reaching the end. Uh, we have reached the end of the essay itself. Um, we've talked about the, the footnotes as well, but we'd like to thank everybody for joining us here. I, I want to make sure... Um, both of you have, a, have an opportunity. If there's anything that you were hoping to, to share or have any concluding thoughts, uh, let, let's share those now. Uh, Bill, do you have anything, uh, anything that, that you were hoping to get, get across uh, that you haven't so far? Just the one thing that Anthony just said that kind of struck a chord with me is this idea of the word vision. Uh, Paul says in Corinthians, or at least whoever the author is, is imposing words in Paul's mouth that, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Joseph always described this as a visionary experience. And I think that opens up a space for us to wrestle with whether this first vision, again, the word vision, was within the walls of his own mind. Uh, And that doesn't take away from it being from God or not from God, or whether this was an actual experience. In other words, if somebody else was sitting next to Joseph in that grove, if they were knelt right next to him, is it feasible that they would not have seen what happened uh, because it was in the walls of his own mind? Or was it a physical experience that they would have taken part in as well? And, and I think that opens up other conversations. I would simply, I guess, conclude maybe with the, the listener that I hope you're, you're open to, as you've listened to all of this, recognizing that, that for some, these details can be troublesome and can uh, cause some angst, can cause some hurt as they try to reconcile the complicated, messy version of all of this with the story they were told. Uh, And so I simply would conclude just saying, like, let's all make space for each other uh, to understand that this does have a lot more details and, and to be able to sit with that uh, and to make a safe space for people to come to different conclusions. Anthony, do you have anything final or sh- should that be the last word? Uh, yeah, I just like to express my appreciation for the invitation to participate in these discussions. Uh, the, these essays were very impactful on my life and, uh, and I'm just really grateful to be able to participate today. And I really appreciate the opportunity. I, I want to express the same. Uh, I, I'm not used to talking about truth claim type stuff, essay type stuff on on a podcast. Um, maybe we can, if if the listeners, uh, hopefully this this has been interesting for you as well. But if the listeners want to hear from from any of us in in our usual arena, Anthony, tell us where they can find you. So I have a blog, uh, unpackingambiguity.com, and people can reach me at unpackingambiguity at gmail.com. Great. Uh, Bill, how about you? Uh, two places. The, there's a website, mormonprimer.com, and that's mormon, P-R-I-M-E-R.com. There, I try to lay out the various points of view about all of these kinds of messy issues so that people can get the full context, find all the resources and footnotes, and kind of come to their own conclusion on how each of these uh, issues kind of settles out. The other place would be Mormon Discussion Podcast.org, uh, where I've spent the last seven years just having conversations, uh, either monologues myself or uh, interviews with scholars and historians on these issues so that people can become better aware of, of again, the messiness that causes some to lose faith uh, and others to, to press ahead in faithfulness. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I, I have to. Before I, I say where you can find me, I have to say 
both to Bill and Anthony. Anthony, your thoughts are just incredible. I've always loved interacting with you over the last couple of years that we've known each other. Uh, the same goes to you, Bill. Uh, that Mormon primer, I think one thing that you did not uh, state that I think is so important to recognize is that each each idea or each topic that is that is walked through um, on that website is presented from all of the different points of view, if you will. So here's a faithful interpretation of it. Here's something that a critic may find uh, a, a problem with that. So I think it's very, very fair and very balanced. So I appreciate your work there. You can find me on uh, the podcast Marriage on a Tightrope. My wife, Katie, and I host that podcast, and it is dedicated to mixed faith marriages and is 100% safe for um, both sides of the fence in a mixed faith marriage. And uh, we've been doing that for about a year and a half under the Mormon Discussions umbrella that, that uh, Bill so graciously let us be a part of. So thank you, everybody, for, for listening. We hope, again, that this was interesting. Uh, we'd love to, to, to do it again soon and get to the, to the other essays. Um, thank you so much for joining us.